So I think we're on page, yeah, page five. Um, this is the question about hydrophobia that we just talked about. This is good, makes it easy. Um, hydrophobia means that it's something that's nonpolar. It doesn't like water, it doesn't mix with water. And this is kind of a theme we go through the whole term. Um, so there is like a little thing they say, what, what dissolves what? And so things that are soluble in water, uh, polar likes polar. So the, they say um, like, likes, like is one of the ways I was taught it. Uh, but polar, so things that are polar and things that are ionic are going to love water. Um, I mentioned that. Yeah, there can be some, you, the polar, nonpolar, sometimes we have ionic compounds. That doesn't happen on this page. When we run into it, I'll mention it. So that again is called hydrophilic. Um, and this becomes important because carbon hydrogen compounds, oil, plastics, the whole thing behind plastics. Um, that plastic is made from oil, uh, and so it is carbon hydrogen, and so it doesn't mix with water, and which is a good thing. All right, this picture here I put there because uh, it helps some students to try to spatially see what's going on. Uh, and again, this is why this one's called an octahedral. You can't really see it, but there are four faces on top and four triangle faces below. Uh, this is just going through, this, these would be the Vesper and the bond angle for all of those. So really we did most of the work on Tuesday. We're gonna go through some special situations now. Um, which is the idea of isomers and resonances. And resonances we already talked about. All right, so I'm gonna pause for a moment. Oh, I guess we have to do these together. So we're gonna draw Lewis structures. This one's 18. Um, I'm gonna give you a hint for drawing your Lewis structure and then I'm gonna pause. This one, the selenium is gonna go in the center. This one, you're going to hook the two carbons up in the center. And then you're going to put everything around them. And then I'll go through the Vesper and stuff. But let me give you like two minutes to try and draw it. Or you can take a two minute break. I'm going to go grab a drink of water. All right, I'm going to go ahead and, and draw my pictures. If you're on a roll, just keep drawing them. The 18 electrons, so sulfur, put an oxygen on each side. Give your octets to the oxygen. And you've used 16, so only two on the center. Your center has two, four, six. So you're going to erase two and move them over. This is a resonance. So. A resonance means you have a, you, you're going to have a double and a single bond, but they have to be to the same element. So if one side was nitrogen and one side was an oxygen, that is not a resonance. So resonance is how we would draw the resonance over here would be we would show the double bond on the other side. And then we'd show our dots. But what's really happening, and next week I think I have a picture in the notes. Um, there's really a cloud over the whole thing. Oh, and then our dots on the center. Um, these two electrons in that bond are actually shared the whole way around over the whole molecule. So remember, everything's really working as vibrations. Electrons are moving so fast, and, and we actually, based on right our emotions and everything, we change the vibrations of our electrons, and that changes your molecules. And so if you think about that, and that we're 70-some percent water, 
your vibrations of the water molecule end up being quite significant. Um, all right, geometry, this is planar triangle bent. 120 degrees and it is polar. Um, a reminder, I do, I will, when we get done today, I'll stay if you want to work on like the first page of your lab. But um, the worksheet, also, if you want me to check your worksheet. Um, and then I will have an office hour on Saturday. And so it's supposed to be a 10 and I'm planning to be there at 10. But um, I just learned today, I teach a continuing education class and they scheduled me for 10 o'clock. Um, instead of nine o'clock, which it's supposed to be. And so I've emailed the students and they all said they're okay with nine o'clock, but um, if, if there's an issue, I will send an email out. And I, so right now we're okay to have our office hour at 10 o'clock. Um, all right, but I will be there on Saturday. So if you want me to look at your lab, if you've done it by Saturday, if you want to work on the lab, um, the weather's not going to be as nice this weekend, right? You can also submit it like early Sunday and have me look at it. And I, I'm not going to write the correct answers. I will just put marks or circle the ones that you have wrong. Um, and so then if you want to redo it. All right. So the ones that have multiple centers. So there's a page on the lab where this is going to happen. You put the carbons together in the middle. Carbons are always the monkey in the middle. And then you distribute everything else, which is our four hydrogens and two chlorines around the carbon. Carbon does not break the octet rule. The octet rule was made for carbon. And so carbon is gonna make four bonds. So you can put that they each have two hydrogens and they each have a chlorine. And then you put the dots on the chlorine and that will get you to 26. Now, there is another way we can do this. You could have decided to put all the hydrogens on one side and all the chlorines on the other side. To do that, you actually have to break it and put it back together. So it'd be, we'd, we'd actually have to take balls off and move them around. So this is an isomer. An isomer is when you actually move um, atoms around. So we have to move atoms. Uh, the organic chem lab next week does a lot with isomers. These just take practice and we have to keep seeing them. And so we'll see them again on Tuesday. So something I want to mention, because this is usually somebody asks this, um, this, again, I made videos last year, and there is a video that says isomers and formal charges. And so it is these two pages. Um, I'm not sure if this is on there. I think this page I made new this year, but um, I think it's this page. And, and I'm having like a horrible memory because this is the first thing I tried to videotape. And I made it like three or four times. And it it's just, I just finally just had to accept that. I'm not going to be a movie star. Um, a lot of students will ask me, well, what about if I show the chlorines like that and the hydrogens like this? Isn't that an isomer also? Because I'm showing one chlorine pointing up and one chlorine pointing down. And sorry, I didn't come prepared like I should have. Um, see how fast I can make a model. <laughs> Single bonds, this is something our topic for Tuesday. Single bonds rotate freely. They There's two electrons and they're always moving around and rotating. Uh, triple bonds and double bonds, there's so many electrons there, they can't move. They're like stuck in place. And so if you show the chlorine up or down, it's the same thing. If you show it to the left, all of these positions, this is a tetrahedral. Um, in a tetrahedral, all four positions are exactly the same thing. So this is not an isomer. 
these are tough for some students. Some of you are really good. You see that as a tetrahedral. Um, I, I kind of, this is where office hours and lab, um, me verbally talking to you, because everybody's brain sees these differently. And uh, one of the things that can help, again, some of you see it, that is the tetrahedral, is if you cover up half of the picture and you look at how many things are around the carbon, so each carbon, that this carbon has one, two, three, four. You wanna still count that, so there, that's a tetrahedral. You're not counting the number of bonds because carbons always have four. You're seeing if a carbon has four single bonds, it's a tetrahedral, which is 109 degrees. Chlorines always pull, so this is polar. Um, so it is a tetrahedral, 109 degrees. I drew a two-dimensional picture. These chlorines are not across from each other. I wish I had made the molecule. Yeah. All right. I'm pretty sure I made it in my other video. I had like on the front of the classroom, I had made all the molecules I was going to talk about. Or actually, I, I we do this one again on Tuesday, and so I'll make the molecule then. Um, but... For right now, the biggest thing is to realize in a tetrahedral, all four positions are exactly the same. I had one the other day. I don't know what happened to, to that big bag of molecules. Um, in a tetrahedral, all the positions are the same. Go ahead, Major. This is different because I moved the chlorine to one carbon. So instead of each carbon having one chlorine, one carbon had both chlorines. That's why that's an isomer. What's your question, Major? The polar, um, but if we try to pull on each side, they will like be able to pull the same. No, because this is going to be more polar. Like if I asked you, this one's pulling much more because it's it's pulling that way. Um, how I drew it, it's hard to see the polarity, but these guys are really at angles around the carbon. Um, so these chlorines, they're not opposite each other. So they're going to have a pull. It's going to be a slight pull, but there is a pull. Um, trying to think how to draw it so you can see the pull. Um, you know, another one. Can't. Because if if you. Yeah, I'll make the molecule for us for Tuesday and I'll show it better. Um, this one, so the times you get isomers, isomers are going to happen two times. They're either going to happen when you have two carbons, so you have multiple centers. Or you have an expanded octet. Because if I actually haven't made it, it's easier to see. Um, and that big bag of atoms, I really don't know. It's like the Easter Bunny's been here and hiding everything from me already. All right, this next one's going to do an expanded octet. The trick to doing this one is you have to draw it like it actually would look, which. Um, you can draw the chlorines across from each other oops, and the fluorines across from each other. So this is going to be the octahedral. And again, the octahedral, you have a square and then something above and below. So in an octahedral, because this is our center, something is always across from something else. So these fluorines are across from each other. Different from a tetrahedral. In a tetrahedral, nothing is across from anything. Um, and then you would put all your dots. Yeah, you know, nobody came to my office hours and I should have sat here building molecules, but I did. So shame on me. Octahedral, these are all 90 degrees. There is an isomer. And they may see what the isomer would be. 
This guy's nonpolar. The isomer is going to be polar. So the nonpolar is you always put the same thing across from itself. Um, in the isomer, you would put the chlorines next to each other. And so the chlorines, because they end up next to each other, like this is our plane or square. Um, the fluorines are going to pull this way. And so that's why we get a pull because they don't have the other ones. Here in my square here, like you can make your square however you want. Um, the chlorines pull across, the fluorines pull across, everything cancels. This one's a lot easier to see. Tetrahedral is the toughest one to understand. And it's the most important one because, again, we're tetrahedrals many levels all right i put that on there because we're going to run into it and um yeah all right so ocn we're going to do formal charges um again i'm a biochemist i have never ever used formal charges um until i was forced to teach them and i had to learn how to use them uh, this is my definition. It works. You can use like the official definition, but you basically take their group number, which has to be the A number. So uh, their valence electrons, and then you subtract lines plus dots. So a line only counts once. Every dot counts. So we will see. So OCN negative. Uh, there is a negative there. We have to have that. So this is going to be 10, 16 electrons. There are actually nine ways you could draw this. We're going to only do three. The nine ways are, because this is saying just draw anything you want, is you can draw with the carbon in the middle three different ways. You can draw with the oxygen in the middle. You can draw with the nitrogen in the middle. And then we're going to use formal charges to say which one's the best. You can also use your brain and figure out which one is the best. But um, the idea is, we can put, what's going to happen is you can end up with a double-double. We'll draw four possible ways just for the fun of it. We could do a triple single. Or we could put the triple bond on the other side and a single. And then we have to put our dots. So whichever side is the triple bond just gets one pair and the other side gets. And then if you remember. Put your little bracket with the negative. Again, I usually forget to show that, so I don't care if you forget or remember. Um, so this is we're drawing three possibilities. And then we're going to do a mathematical calculation because humans love to have mathematical proof of why. Now, before we do the mathematical proving of why, which is what formal charges are, would anybody like to tell me which structure is the best one and why? A, is it the triple bond for the nitrogen, the very last one? It is. And we're going to, why? Nitrogen is the greediest and it has the three double bond. Like the yeah, three because bond. oxygen oxygen's so greedy, it forces the triple bond. Now, if we had an oxygen on each side, like carbon dioxide, you're going to split it equal double double. They don't like make one of them can't be greedier than the other, but this is going to be the best one because oxygen is so greedy. Uh, you can say it is the most electronegative. That would be the scientific way of saying it or it is the greediest. Oxygen is so greedy. Uh, so it doesn't want to share. It really is terrible at sharing. So now we're going to do the formal charges. So that's why I, you can see I have an attitude about formal charges. So the group number, this goes back to the A group number. Oxygen is going to be six group number. Nitrogen is a five. 
and carbon is a four. So you can say group number or valence electron. So if we do it for carbon, carbon's easy. Its group number is four, and then carbon has one, two, three, four bonds around it. So four minus four, it's going to be a zero. Simple enough. Nitrogen is group number five. And then you count the lines and you count the dots. So there's two lines and four dots. So we'd have five minus six, and that is negative one. And then oxygen is uh, six is its group number. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. So six minus six, it gets a zero. When you add up the formal charges, the sum must equal the charge of the compound. And so it does. The compound had a negative one. All right, so let's move on. So carbon on all of these is going to be four minus four, so it's a zero. So again, group four, then minus four lines. So you only count lines once using my formula. The official formula is you do the valence electrons minus Bonding electrons divided by two plus non-bonding electrons. But, all right, so oxygen is number six minus one, two, three, four, five. So six minus five, oxygen gets to be a plus one. That, that's never going to happen. That never happens. That, that's not possible. Uh, and then here, nitrogen is going to be number five minus seven. So six dots in one line. So it gets to be a negative two. So this is just a hot mess because there's no way you're going to force oxygen into a plus one. The sum of this does equal negative one, but there's no way that happens. But you could get that answer logically. Unfortunately, on your study set, you're going to have to do a formal charge because I have to formally teach you how to do this. I will tell you, chemists are obsessed with formal charges. My son's teacher Joey, Joey did not get 100% um, on his study set because he kept asking me questions and I do it without formal charges and I apparently was giving him wrong answers on his study set. So, all right, so oxygen is six and it's going to be minus seven. So six dots in a lone pair and it's negative one and it's like the happiest, well, it wants to be negative two. Carbon is four minus four, which is a zero and nitrogen is five minus five, which is a zero. Um, so the sum equals negative one, and this one's the best one because oxygen's the greediest, uh, and so it gets the negative formal charge. Now, another comment I will give you about formal charges is if everything can be a zero, great, give everything a zero. That's not going to happen on this one because you have a negative one. All right, one more piece is something like SO2. Uh, SO2, this, we drew this um, on the previous page. It was a resonance. And when you do formal charges on resonance, so that was what our picture looks like. Um, so let's go ahead and do them. So oxygen over here would be six minus six. So we would say it's a zero. And the oxygen on this side would be six minus seven, so we would give it a minus one. Now, what happens on a resonance is the oxygen's average. That is the idea of what a resonance is. One of the oxygen, the oxygens are both a one and a half bond. So actually, they're both negative one half. It's, you don't end up making one oxygen zero and the other one a negative one. And then the sulfur, the way your teacher is doing, would be a plus one. Now, you can Google this one, and what they'll tell you is, well, that can't be right. It must be a double bond, because if you made a double and a double, then this, everything's zero. And so according to formal charges, my picture is wrong. I talked to the gnomes. The gnomes say I'm right because of the length of the bond, which we'll get to in a minute. All right, organic molecule geometry. We're going to do a lot with this next week. Um, and again, it's being able to look at it. So 
One thing I mentioned earlier, they, what's missing from the oxygens? The dots. You will see most pictures are not actually Lewis structures. You want to add the dots so that you get your answers right. So all of these the oxygens are going to have um, dots on them. And the same with the nitrogen, they don't show its dots. So it's showing that as 2, 4, 6. And so if you want to give it the octet, you don't have to. I'm doing it today to help you see it. Um, and so that's going to give us, if we did bond angles, this nitrogen is a triangle pyramid. So it's making three bonds, and to have its octet, it must have a lone pair of electrons. Uh, and so its bond angle is 109. This carbon in the middle is 109. It's a tetrahedral. And I put these on here because it really takes practice. But if you see a carbon with four single bonds, that's a tetrahedral. So what's that carbon going to be? does not have four single bonds, it's not a tetrahedral. This carbon has single, a single, and a double. Single, single, double, that, that's three total. So this is 120. This is a, a planar triangle. Um, yeah. And then the oxygen. Um, so again, you have to be careful. The oxygens, you want to put the dots on. That will help you. Uh, it is it is 109. It's bent. There's questions about that. Everybody's been quiet. The sun has been so nice the past two days. All right. So the next one, the nitrogen again isn't showing its dots. Um, so you don't have to add the dots. I'm going to do it today just because we're learning. And it's a shorthand not showing the dots. Um, so this nitrogen, nitrogens you're going to see love to be the triangle pyramid. So it's a or a tetrahedral pyramid is what some people will say. So it's 109 degrees. I want to remind you there's different types of pyramids. So there's square based pyramids. There's actually even a pentagonal paste a pentagon based pyramid. So you can have any shape as your base in the pyramid. Um, a tetrahedral pyramid means triangle base. All right. Um, when we write it like this, this is saying the same thing as over here. Um, this is the exact same molecule as this. So what I wanted to show you, because I know this starts showing up and we're going to do more with these on Tuesday. This is a carbon. This corner right here, that's a carbon. That's this carbon here. Carbons have to make four bonds. So there must be a hydrogen above it. Let me just write it in pink. Um, so that's not being shown here. Uh, and another hydrogen. So that's this carbon. So this was a shorthand way of showing it. And then this is this carbon. So it has double bond oxygen and then the OH. So it's just trying to show you the zigzagging that happens when things. Um, and so we just show like these down here, these are carbons. Each corner is a carbon. This is a carbon here, over, way over here. That's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon. And then you have to add hydrogens the carbon has four bonds. So I'm going to have you try and do this. I'm going to pause it. I want you to figure out how many carbons, how many hydrogens, how many oxygens. So you're doing your carbon, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogens for each of these compounds and see what you get. Um, and then you can tell me what your bond angles are. I'm going to pause and see if I can find the tetrahedral with the chlorines. So back to the previous page, this major, major disappeared on me. Um, 
Oh, there he is. He's back. Sorry, I, so, sorry, oh, you're call. fine. That's fine. Uh, so this is the tetrahedral. There is no way you can make the green balls across from each other in a tetrahedral. Um, it's just the nature of a tetrahedral. So even when you have multiple centers, so two carbons or three carbons, so the white balls are the hydrogens, the chlorines, so the single bond freely rotates. So if we show the chlorines facing up, facing down, they're never actually across from each other um, because this is always rotating. Um, it's different with the double bond, but it's just it's just something you have to recognize with um, a single bond in the tetrahedral that all the positions are the same. So whether I show the chlorine here or here or here, it's always the same. Um, that's probably the best I can explain it right now. So these guys, they're isomers. You should have gotten the same number of carbons and hydrogen. So this is carbon one. So there's four carbons, right? So one, two, three, four. So every corner is a carbon. Uh, they each have one nitrogen. They have two oxygens. They don't show the one on the nitrogen. Now we have to count our hydrogens. So uh, this would have hydrogen, hydrogen. You can just show a line or you can write hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. So we have two, four, six, eight, nine. And then on this one, we should get three hydrogens here, two here, and we just need one here. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These guys are isomers because they have the same formula. So same molecular formula. but we rearranged the atoms. Now, when I'm saying we rearrange the atoms, I'm not saying we're just rotating the bond. That's not rearranging, that's still the same thing. Rearranging is I actually have to take things off and move them around. And so that is an isomer because now both of the chlorines are on one side. So I picked these because again, you've heard me say it a couple of times, you guys are going to be doing a paper on a molecule. Um, so if you're going to healthcare or if you're into something like that, uh, GABA is, and you may have heard of it, even if you're not into healthcare, because if you're on a pain medication, I don't even know what um, it's called. But GABA is a neurotransmitter in our brain. Um, so we have two, one is glutamate and one is GABA. And the two of them together, help to balance our brain. So it's not that one's good and one's bad. There's no such thing as good and bad. They keep a balance there. And so GABA is the one that that um, helps mellow it and glutamate helps to keep things, keep us going. Um, and so GABA always gets the attention because it helps keep things mellow. People who meditate tend to have much higher levels of GABA because um, it is one of the ones that is um, stimulated in meditation. All right. Anyway, GABA is really cool. Um, there's been a lot of research done on it. Alpha aminobutyric acid, I don't actually know anything about. I think it's just an isomer of it. Um, and so, but I'm sure something cool will happen. Uh, I talked about free radicals a little bit, that a free radical is that you have an odd number of electrons. And odd number means um, it's going to cause havoc. So it's going to create chaos in your life um, looking for an electron. And so our body has natural defenses against that. So um, we have enzymes that help to fight that. Uh, that's why eating fruits and vegetables are just loaded with vitamins that will go in. Vitamin C is known as the big one. Uh, vitamin C has a bond that will change. And in doing that, it gives up two electrons. And so it fills in free radicals that happen in your body. Um, but taking vitamin C as a pill, that works 
lovely, but taking it in a fruit, it actually works much better because uh, it turns out vibrations are everything. And so this is going into quantum mechanics. So when you get it in a whole food, there are vibrations. So even though the whole food, the fruit, that little orange that you eat, um, usually I give out oranges at this point in the class. So you can imagine that. Um, it only has like 60 or 50 milligrams of vitamin C and people will say, oh, I can go and take a, a pill that has 500 milligrams, so 10 times better. But how it works when you're getting it in the whole food with all the other phytomolecules, all the other plant-based molecules, it actually has a synergistic effect and has a bigger impact because your body vibrationally knows what to do with it. Um, and so eat whole foods, don't eat junk food. All right. We have one more page. Any questions? Or when you do the study set, that's where the questions are. Um, all right. So I made a video of this one last year, three times, and we'll go through it. Um, and then there is a video there. I'll put this one up there, but there's a video of just this page. It's like 18 minutes or something. Um, and it's me standing at the blackboard trying to teach how to do these. So this is another one of those charts you need. And the bond dissociation energy, this is how much energy is needed to break a chemical bond. That's, that's how the definition is. How I think of it is this is how much energy is stored in a chemical bond. This is in kilojoules. Chemical bonds are little batteries. They are storage of energy. Um, and so a high, the how this is read is hydrogen, hydrogen bond has 436 kilojoules. If, and I know my thing seems to be blurry. If we had a nitrogen oxygen, you find where the two match. And so that would have 201 kilojoules. If it's a double bond or a triple bond, it does have much more. So a nitrogen, like up here, a nitrogen, nitrogen is 163. But when we get to the double bond, it's 418. When we get to the triple bond, it's 945. Um, and so I just realized something it seems to be missing. It must be in next week's thing. Um, I'm going to. There's a blank on the back page, or actually we can do it up here. There is something called bond order. And bond order is equal to the number of bonds divided by the number of connections. No, that sounds kind of funny, but if we go back to SO2, SO2 has three bonds and only two connections. So its bond order is three halves. What bond order is, even more simplistically than having a formula, because again, we keep having to make these mathematical formulas for things, is it's the average bond. So if you have a double and a single, you average two and one and you get 1.5, which is three halves. Um, as you increase the bond order, meaning going from single to double to triple, you increase the bond energy. And bond energy is related to bond strength. So, so it is technically called bond energy, but another way of thinking of it is as bond strength. Um, so a triple bond is the strongest bond of them all because there's six electrons in there. So, of course, that's going to be much better than having two. Um, however, triple bonds are the most reactive. They're extremely unstable because that's just too much potential stored in such a small space. Um, the other thing that happens is as you increase, again, this is saying going like from a single to a double to a triple, you decrease the bond length. So uh, gnomes have these little calipers and they're able to go in and measure the length of bonds. And so there's a chart somewhere. Um, I'm sure you can find them online where they've actually, I don't know how they can estimate the length of bonds, but they actually figure some of those things out. We're going to talk about this more next week. Um, for right now, it's just the bond dissociation energy, but that's kind of goes along with this and gives you a prelude to next week. 
So the formula to calculate this is bonds broken minus bonds formed. So if you remember we did thermodynamics, we did something similar, but we actually did the opposite. So we need to draw many Lewis structures. H2 is hydrogen, hydrogen. Cl2 is chlorine to chlorine. You can draw your dots. And then here we're going to have two hydrogen chlorine bonds. Right? So that's what's happened in our chemical reaction. That we took hydrogen, hydrogen, they collided. We had talked about collisions, kinetics, this term. They collide, the hydrogens and chlorines bond to each other, and we end up with two HCLs. All right, so looking at the chart now, the hydrogen-hydrogen bond um, is going to be 436 kilojoules. Now, when you do this, if you write it under, so this is my hydrogen, we're going to label it by just writing above it. Um, and then plus my chlorine-chlorine bond. When you write the bonds, you don't have to show the dots. Um, chlorine's way down here. So that's 242 kilojoules. You guys, remember units? This is our one chance to do math tonight. Uh, and then we subtract. So these are my bonds broken. And then we're going to have two... And then we find hydrogen and chlorine is 432 kilojoules. So this is my hydrogen chlorine bond. Um, and so you can label by just writing above what it is. And then we just punch it in our magic calculator and we get a number. So actually, your study set for Tuesday, the first two questions are like this. So you're going to need this chart. So there's like three charts we've had so far. So negative 186 kilojoules. Um, so what's the negative mean? Exothermic. It's exothermic. It released energy. So in this reaction, it's exothermic. It's releasing energy. Now, the thing that's interesting, and I have you do this on the worksheet, I think this is, um, your, I actually give you the chart from last term. And so from last term with calorimetry, we did products minus reactants. You get a similar answer, but you don't get the exact same answer. So you might get like negative 202. I mean, they're off by, by like 5 to 10 percent. So any idea why the answers come out different? Well, calorimetry was actually done in the lab. That somebody actually measured temperatures and did calculations and figured those numbers out. These numbers, how are these figured out? Like gnomes go in there and pull on the bonds and say, oh, this is how strong this bond is. So these are kind of... Um, the bonds are figured out by different, like here it tells you, no, nope, these are from coats. Um, so the, the bond, the measurement, the te the, these are more like hypothetical numbers. Um, and the other issue with this chart, this chart assumes that every hydrogen chlorine bond or every, it's more the carbon carbon bonds, that every carbon carbon bond is exactly the same. And that's not actually true because it depends more on what all is with the carbon. Um, so like in this case, there's all these hydrogens. Um, there might be a chlorine attached to a carbon. And so it's really the whole picture, the whole molecule that matters, which calorimetry just looks at the whole molecule. It doesn't look at each little piece. All right, let's go ahead and go through this one. We have a hydrogen-hydrogen bond here for C3H6. The only way this will work out is you need a double bond. And then we would have hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. My middle carbon would just get one hydrogen. 
And then this guy on the other side, my double bond would have two. So you have to have a double bond. My product is C3H8, and that one works with single bonds. This is like once you take organic chemistry, you really just need like one week of organic chemistry. You just know when there's a double bond and when there's not. There's certain rules with carbons and hydrogens. You guys are going to learn a whole year of organic chemistry. Well, no, like a whole term in a two hour video lab. All right. So let's figure out our bonds. We have a hydrogen hydrogen bond. We have one, two, three, four, five, six carbon hydrogen bonds. We have a carbon carbon bond. And we have a carbon carbon double bond. This is all on my reactant side. These are all the bonds we're breaking. On the other side, I have eight carbon hydrogen bonds. And then can I you, have. Can you please move the paper up a little bit? Two carbon carbon bonds. Thank I'm you. just counting what type of bonds I have. So when you do this on the homework, you have to draw the molecule and figure out your bonds. Now, there's two ways you can do the math. You can figure out all these numbers, or you can go, wait, not all the bonds broke. There were six carbon hydrogen bonds. Six of them are still there. So we can actually reduce this. So these six are still there. So all we did was we made two new ones. Does that make sense? Um, what I found is the students who do this correctly, they usually write all of them and then they reduce the ones that are repetitive. Uh, same here, the carbon single bond is still there, so we can cross it off this side. And over here, we just made one new one. The double bond became the carbon carbon single bond. Does that make sense? Um, and so that's all there is to this. And then we would look up at the chart the hydrogen hydrogen is 436. Uh, please make sure you put units. And again, if you have it labeled, that anybody should be able to follow it if they have it in the right place on the screen. Uh, when you have a double bond, you have to look at a different place. Um, and so this is 610 kilojoules. So these are my bonds broken. And then you always subtract the bonds formed. Uh, and this is always much, this, this is actually easier than the other method. Although this one is probably the one that is more approximation. Um, so bonds formed. So this is gonna be two times, what was my carbon hydrogen? 413. And again, it's kilojoules or kilojoules per mole. The two is technically a mole, and then one carbon carbon is 346 kilojoules. And here we go. Let's see, punch it in. Um, so, questions why well, I'm punching it in. I know, I kind of feel like Damon and Major are the only ones here. <laughs> and Max isn't here tonight, so you guys are on the spot. I know Tristan's here. He went to go. Thank you, Tristan, for turning on your video and waving. Actually shows a lot. Anybody else who is, I can't see you because the order of it. I got 566. That doesn't seem that must be right. Somebody else punch it in or you're going to go with my answer. That doesn't seem familiar. I got negative 126. Yeah, I don't. Oh, I know why I got it wrong. I forgot to subtract. Yeah, it's negative 126. Your answer sounded better. I was looking at the numbers going, mine's wrong. Thank you. This is like when we're in class, there's always much more interaction from everybody because you're there in person. Um, so again, it's exothermic. They're not always going to be exothermic. Um, anybody, questions? 
No, we're done. You can go watch the sunset. Sorry, I just have one last question. Go ahead. So when it's asking for, in the chart, when it's asking if it's an isomers or a reasoning, do we have to rewrite the molecule? Um, usually, I, are you asking me if you have to draw it? Yeah. Yeah. I I'm just thought, I didn't you. see that work. Yeah. Okay. I, I I pretty much do. You don't have to do this mess here, but yeah, that actually on the lab. Thank you for asking that. Um, so on the lab, just to be clear with what he asked. So this is the lab. It's just there's there's a lot of pages of writing and and they're worth it because. But um, these first this first group, there there are no resonance or isomers, so you're going to leave this blank or you can color it in. Um, so you're just going to draw your Lewis structure and do that. So that you should be able to do. Uh, when we get to these, these have, some of them have resonance structures. That's why I said welcome to the resonance ones. So you you would draw your resonance and you should, you can write resonance. This is more also a learning for you. Um, so on the lab, I tried to organize it. It's not always going to be nice and organized. This page is where you have multiple carbons. So there are isomers. Oh, I labeled them. Look at that. I must have known it was going to be a hard task for me. Um, so you're going to draw for those your isomers. And when you do your isomers, you do want to label. This way I highlighted it. You have to label your isomers if they're polar or nonpolar. Um, this polar nonpolar is for your original structure or somehow you have to indicate. And then for the last page, this is the page that is the expanded octet. So you're going to, all of these are going to break the octet rule. And if they have different things around the center, so arsenic is your only center. So one thing in the center, if you're expanding, breaking the octet rule, you only have one center and everything's around it. Um, if you have different things around the center, like on this one, this guy's going to do an isomer. Uh, this one's going to do an isomer because you can see it has different things like this one's not an isomer because it's two fluorines. That one's only fluorines. This one's going to do an isomer. I should have written. Um, and then a quick comment. One of them has two isomers. So there's actually you would have to draw both of them to get full credit. And yeah. Um, so the lab is hopefully to help refine this. And then next week we take this the next step, which is hybridization. And then it actually starts making even more sense by then. But we pretty much these first three weeks just like deal with molecules. All right. Great question. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? If not, I'm going to stop and then...